Good afternoon, or good morning, if you're out west. On behalf of the Center for Science and the Public Interest, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar about the new and very controversial Dietary Guidelines for Americans. I'm Michael Jacobson, the Executive Director of, of CSPI, Center for Science and the Public Interest, and I'll serve as the moderator of the webinar. I'm delighted that Dr. Karen DeSalvo, the Assistant Secretary for Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, was able to carve out some time to participate in the webinar. Before coming to Washington, Dr. DeSalvo was the Health Commissioner for the City of New Orleans between 2011 and 2014. Also with us today is CSPI's longtime Nutrition Director, Bonnie F. Liebman. Many of you are probably familiar with Bonnie's articles in our Nutrition Action Health Letter. Now, by way of background, CSPI has monitored the dietary guidelines since the first one was published by the U.S. Department of Health and Human, uh, Health Education and Welfare back in 1980 and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And we've seen these dietary guidelines evolve from a slender, almost pocket size, and very consumer-friendly 20-page pamphlet into a report about 100 pages or so filled with graphs, tables, and appendices. And the new Dietary Guidelines report called 2015 to 2020 uh, is, has all those graphs, tables, and appendices that uh, everybody loves so much, uh, beautifully done, I must say. Um, um, and um, the um, uh, press accounts that we've seen in the last day or two remind me of the blind men and the elephant, the children's story, or the Bible. Depending on one's views, one can take away very different messages. Now, while the Dietary Guidelines for Americans is written mostly for professionals and policymakers, the Department of Agriculture translates that information into language that's much more um, uh, consumer friendly and easily understood by children and adults. And the MyPlay program, I think, is a very successful way of getting that information via the web, pamphlets, handouts, and so on, uh, certainly to millions and millions of school children. So with, with that as the background, let's move into the webinar. And let me thank you so much, Dr. DeSalvo. I know this is a, a very busy time, um, but we appreciate your spending a little bit of that time with us. So take it away. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to everybody who's, who's joining us today. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to share more about this, uh, this important policy and initiative today. Um, you all are um, such important stakeholders in health and nutrition, and we we are so happy that you have an interest in working with us to protect the health of all Americans. Before I launch into this, um, I just want to make certain that, that um, everybody's on mute um, and ask the, ask the moderator if, if he can hear me all right. Yeah, we, we hear you sound great. All right, fantastic. Um, so, so as, as you're all aware, yesterday we released the latest edition of the Dietary Guidelines and are looking forward to sharing with you today how this edition provides recommendations to help Americans make healthy choices in their daily lives that will help prevent chronic disease while still enjoying a healthy diet. Next slide, please. Healthy eating is one of the most powerful tools that everyone has to reduce the onset of disease and the amount of money we spend on health care. Next slide, please. Although we've heard good news recently that we have finally begun to stem the tide of rates and new cases of diabetes, we still have much work to do to help Americans get and stay healthy. Because we know that a lifetime of healthy eating helps to prevent chronic diseases, the dietary guidelines focus on disease prevention rather than on disease treatment. About half of all American adults, or 117 million, have one or more preventable chronic diseases, many of which are related to poor quality eating patterns and physical inactivity. These include cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, some cancers, and poor bone health. 
Simultaneously, many Americans do not eat a diet that aligns with the dietary guidelines. The Healthy Eating Index is a measurement of how well diets conform to federal dietary guidelines using a 0 to 100 point scale. And as you can see on this graph, adherence to the dietary guidelines has been between 49 and 58 out of 100 points since the 1990s. The dietary guidelines are a critical tool for all nutrition and, health, nutrition and health professionals to help Americans make healthy choices in their daily lives to prevent chronic disease and to enjoy a healthy diet. Next slide. The 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans is the nation's trusted resource for evidence-based nutrition recommendations for Americans ages two years and older. The main purpose of the Dietary Guidelines is to inform the development of federal food, nutrition, and health policies and programs. These programs impact millions of people each day. At HHS, examples of these programs are the Older Americans Act Nutrition Services Program and Head Start, as well as healthy lifestyle campaigns by the CDC, the NIH, and the FDA. At USDA, examples of these programs are the School Lunch Program, the School Breakfast Program, and Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC. HHS and USDA share a responsibility to the American public to ensure that advancements in scientific understanding about the role of nutrition in health are incorporated into the dietary guidelines on a regular basis. That's why we release a new edition of the dietary guidelines every five years, as is required by the 1990 National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act. Next slide. Updating the dietary guidelines every five years as directed by Congress is one of the critical things that we do. Nutrition science, like any other science, evolves, and so it's important that the dietary guidelines reflect the full body of the best of science of our time. We know more about the relationship between nutrition and health each time we develop a new edition of the guidelines. They are developed through a process that has become increasingly more robust and transparent with each edition. The process begins with a review of the science, followed by translating that science into policy and ultimately implementing the dietary guidelines, which began yesterday and continues over the coming years. The dietary guidelines process began with a review of the current available scientific and medical knowledge. This is accomplished through the use of an external advisory committee of experts from across the U.S. The 2015 advisory committee was charged with reviewing the 2010 dietary guidelines to determine topics for which new scientific evidence may be available and to review that evidence to inform the development of the 2015-2020 edition. The advisory committee used four state-of-the-art approaches to review and analyze the available evidence. Original systematic reviews, existing systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and reports by federal agencies or leading scientific organizations, data analyses, and food patterning, pattern modeling analyses. This multifaceted approach allowed the advisory committee to thoroughly examine the totality of evidence for its topics of interest. Most of the committee's conclusion statements on nutrition and health were informed by systematic reviews, which are a gold standard for informing clinical practice guidelines and public health policies nationwide. Public comments are accepted throughout this stage. The advisory committee's review of the science is then submitted to the secretaries of HHS and USDA in the scientific report of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. Next slide. In the next stage, the departments created the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines. They are written by a group of experts in nutrition and health science federal policy writing and program implementation from both HHS and USDA. Similar to previous editions, this edition builds upon the preceding one with revisions informed by the Advisory Committee scientific report in consideration of public and federal agency comments. Federal agencies with scientific expertise in nutrition and health, like the CDC, the NIH, the FDA, the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service provided comments on the Advisory Committee's report served as technical reviewers of the policy document and were consulted throughout the policy development process. Federal clearance of the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines culminated with a review and approval across agencies in both departments and ultimately by the secretaries of HHS and USDA. Next slide. 
We are now entering into the third stage in which we implement the dietary guidelines through federal food and nutrition programs and initiatives and public health policies that will impact millions across the country each day. In addition to the implementation of the dietary guidelines by federal programs, health professionals rely on them for evidence-based nutrition information that can be used to improve eating behaviors and the people they serve. Academic institutions, national public health groups, advocacy groups, and the media refer to the dietary guidelines when translating scientific information to the general public. And the food industry also uses the dietary guidelines in planning food reformulations and when marketing and promoting products to consumers. Next slide. Now that we know more about the process that has informed this edition of the guidelines, I'd like to walk you through some of the primary themes that emerged from the process. Can I can remind folks on this phone to go ahead and put themselves on mute? Thank you. Specifically, a growing body of evidence supported eating patterns as a primary emphasis of the 2015-2020 guidelines. An eating pattern is not a rigid prescription, but rather an adaptable framework in which individuals can enjoy foods that meet their personal, cultural, and traditional preferences and fit within their budget. Healthy eating patterns consist of all foods and beverages that a person consumes over time, fit together like a puzzle, to meet the nutritional needs and support their health, and may be more predictive of overall health and disease risk than any individual food or nutrient. There's more than one type of healthy eating pattern, and Throughout the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines, the healthy, US eating, the healthy U.S. style eating pattern is used as an example of a healthy eating pattern to illustrate the specific amounts and limits for food groups and other dietary components. Two additional healthy eating patterns, the healthy Mediterranean style eating pattern and healthy vegetarian eating pattern, are provided as examples to reflect other styles of eating. Next slide. This edition provides five guidelines to provide a framework for moving forward with these eating patterns. The first is to follow a healthy eating pattern across the lifespan. This means considering all food and beverage choices. Choosing a healthy eating pattern at an appropriate calorie level will help individuals to achieve and maintain a healthy body weight, support nutrient adequacy, and reduce the risk of chronic disease. The second guideline is to focus on variety, nutrient density, and amount. By choosing a variety of nutrient-dense foods across and within all food groups in recommended amounts, individuals will be able to meet nutrient needs within calorie limits. The third guideline is to limit calories from added sugars, saturated fats, and reduce sodium intake. Individuals can cut back on foods and beverages higher in these components and to add amounts that fit within healthy eating patterns. The fourth guideline is to shift to healthier food and beverage choices. What this means is that every meal is an opportunity to choose healthier foods and beverages in place of less healthy options. Consideration of cultural and personal preferences and health needs can make these shifts easier to accomplish and maintain. The fifth guideline is to support healthy eating patterns for all. This guideline acknowledges that everyone has a role to play in helping create and support healthy eating patterns in multiple settings nationwide, whether it's from the home, to the school, to work, to the community level. Next slide. These five guidelines are supplemented with a number of key recommendations that provide more specific guidance as to what is and is not included in the healthy eating pattern. First, individuals should consume a healthy eating pattern that accounts for all foods and beverages within an appropriate cal calorie level. This healthy eating pattern will include a variety of vegetables from all the subgroups, dark green, red and orange, legumes like beans and peas, starchy and other vegetables, fruits, especially whole fruits, grains, at least half of which should be whole grains, fat-free or low dairy, including milk, yogurt, cheese, and or fortified soy beverages, a variety of protein foods, including seafood, lean meats and poultry, eggs, legumes, nuts, seeds, and soy products, oils like canola, corn, olive, peanuts, safflower, soybean, and sunflower oils, and those that are naturally present in nuts, seeds, seafood, olives, and avocados. The healthy eating pattern limits saturated fats and trans fats added sugars and sodium. 
Next slide. The key recommendations also include quantitative limits for dietary components of particular public health concern in the U.S. These limits can help people achieve healthy eating patterns within their calorie limits. First, uh, individuals should consume less than 10% of calories per day from added sugars. When added sugars exceed 10% of calories, a healthy eating pattern can be difficult to achieve. And previous dietary guidelines have addressed added sugars, but this is the first addition to provide a specific quantitative target. Next, individuals should consume less than 10% of calories per day from saturated fats. Replacing saturated fats with unsaturated fats is associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. However, replacing saturated fats with carbohydrates is not associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. This this recommendation is similar to the 2010 dietary guidelines. Next, individuals should consume less than 2,300 milligrams per day of sodium. This recommendation is based on evidence that showing a relationship between increased sodium intake and increased blood pressure. This is similar to what we recommended in the 2010 dietary guidelines for healthy adults and provides more focused recommendations for those with borderline high blood pressure, and high blood pressure who would benefit from further reduction to 1,500 milligrams a day. Lastly, if alcohol is consumed, it should be consumed in moderation. This means up to one drink a day for women and up to two drinks a day for men, and only by adults of legal drinking age. It's not recommended that individuals begin drinking or drink more for any reason, and there are many circumstances in which individuals should not drink, such as during pregnancy. In tandem with these recommendations, Americans of all ages, children, adults, adolescents, and others, should meet the physical activity guidelines for Americans to help promote health and reduce the risk of chronic disease. Next slide. Information on other dietary components is also provided in this edition of the dietary guidelines. A few topics with new or updated information include cholesterol and caffeine. The topic of cholesterol, the 2010 edition no longer includes a key recommendation from the 2010 dietary guidelines to limit consumption of dietary cholesterol to 300 milligrams per day. However, this change does not suggest that dietary cholesterol is no longer important to consider when building, building healthy eating patterns. As recommended by the Institute of Medicine, individuals should eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible while consuming a healthy eating pattern. In general, foods that are higher in dietary cholesterol, such as fatty meats and high-fat dairy products, are also higher in saturated fats. For example, a healthy U.S.-style eating pattern described in the dietary guidelines contains approximately 100 to 300 milligrams of cholesterol across the 12 calorie levels. On the topic of caffeine, the 2015 edition is the first to include guidance on this subject. Much of the available evidence on caffeine focuses on coffee intake. Evidence has shown that three to five eight-ounce cups a day can be incorporated into a healthy eating pattern. However, individuals who do not consume caffeinated coffee or other caffeinated beverages are not encouraged to incorporate them into their eating pattern. Next slide. It is critical to note that although there have been important updates to this edition, the basic building blocks of a healthy lifestyle described in this edition remain consistent with previous ones. This includes eating a variety of nutrient-dense foods within and across food groups, guidance to consume more vegetables, fruits, grains, protein foods, low-fat and fat-free dairy and oils, and with all within an appropriate calorie level, and with limited amounts of saturated fat, trans fat, added sugars, and sodium. This remains constant with the, consistent with the previous edition. What's different is an increased focus on eating patterns. We now know more about how these components fit together. This new edition reflects its and understanding about the relationships between healthy eating patterns and health outcomes and emphasize the importance of the totality of what you eat, your eating patterns as a whole. This evidence has confirmed what we previously knew about the key elements of healthy eating patterns. In addition to updated guidance on cholesterol and guidance on caffeine, this edition also includes updated guidance on sugars and sodium. Next slide. This figure provides a snapshot of current intakes compared to recommendations for food groups and oils, calories from added sugars, 
and saturated fats and sodium. That center line is the goal or limit. The bar represents the percent of the U.S. population ages one year older who are below, at, or above each dietary goal or limit. In short, the orange bars represent the percent of Americans who are not meeting the recommendations and show areas with room for improvement. About three-fourths of the population has an eating pattern that is low in vegetables, fruit, dairy, and oils. More than half of the population is meeting or exceeding the total grain and total protein foods recommendations, but as discussed in the policy document, are not meeting the recommendations for subgroups when within each of these food groups. Notably, for total grains, intakes should shift to increase whole grains, and for protein foods, intakes should shift to increase seafood. Additionally, most Americans exceed the limits for added sugars, saturated fats, and sodium. Most eating patterns are too high in calories. Now that we have a clear picture of where we are, we can talk about what this edition of the Dietary Guidelines recommends for how we get to where we need to be. Next slide. For the average consumer, it will be easy to get overwhelmed by the idea of changing everything that they eat. By focusing on small improvements or small shifts, eating healthy becomes more manageable. So many choices to make every single day about what to eat and drink. Each choice is an opportunity to make small, healthy changes, like replacing sugar-sweetened beverages with beverages with no sugar added. And here's a little more food for thought. About 9 in 10 Americans get less than the recommended amount of vegetables. Instead of a whole new way of eating, finding ways to incorporate more vegetables into dishes we're already making or eating will make a difference. Further, Americans consume about 50% more sodium than the dietary guidelines recommend. Using nutrition facts labels to check for sodium, especially in processed foods like pizza, pasta dishes, and soups, will be helpful. Dietary guidelines provides many examples and offers interactive, interactive graphics, like just the snapshot provided here in this slide, to, to illustrate how a small shift in our food choices can help us follow a healthy eating pattern. Next slide. Everyone will have a role to play in encouraging easy, accessible, and affordable ways to support healthy choices at home, school, work, and in our communities. The dietary guidelines outline several strategies that can be used to support Americans in making healthy choices. For example, at home, individuals and families can try out small changes to find what works for them, like adding more vegetables to their favorite dishes, planning meals, and cooking at home, and incorporating physical activity into time with family or friends. Schools can continue to offer healthy food choices in cafeterias and vending machines, provide nutrition education programs in school gardens, and encourage parents and caregivers to promote healthy changes at home. Workplaces can offer healthy food options in the cafeteria, vending machines, and at staff meetings and functions, provide health and wellness programs, and nutrition counseling, encourage walking, meetings, or activity breaks. Communities can increase access to affordable, Health, healthy food choices through community gardens, farmers markets, shelters, and food banks, and create walkable communities by maintaining safe public spaces. And food retail outlets can inform consumers about making healthy changes and provide healthy food choices. Next slide. In closing, three main takeaways from this edition of the Dietary Guidelines are eat for health and for the long run. The path to improving health through nutrition is to follow a healthy eating pattern that is right for you. The science behind healthy eating patterns tells us that they can help prevent chronic disease like obesity, heart disease, and type 2 diabetes. Second, start with small changes. With so many choices to make every single day about what to eat and drink, each choice is an opportunity to make a small healthy change. And finally, support healthy choices for everyone. Everyone has a role to play in encouraging easy, accessible, and affordable ways to support healthy choices at home, school, work, and in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. DeSalvo, for that very clear tour through the uh, Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2015 to 2020. Uh, and that last, uh, your last comment about supporting community-wide changes is something that I know many of the participants on this call are very interested in being activists at the national level, but especially at the state and local level. 
Um, and I see we're beginning to get some questions uh, sent in. And while Bonnie Liebman is talking in a minute, please feel free to submit questions, and we'll take as many of them as we as we possibly can. Um, so now, Bonnie Liebman, the uh, nutrition director for CSPI. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'd like to point out, uh, I'd like to start out by pointing out that the guidelines have remained fairly constant over time. They've always encouraged people to eat more fruits and vegetables. They've always encouraged us to eat more whole grains. The advice has gotten more specific, more precise over time, but it's remained generally the same. Uh, the same holds for uh, healthy protein foods. Uh, the new gu guidelines do recommend less meat in particular for teenage boys and for men, um, as you can see on the far right. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. The guidelines uh, continue to recommend that we eat less saturated fat. Uh, in particular, the recent guidelines say less than 10% of calories from saturated fat. Um, and the cholesterol guidelines, the cholesterol advice, hasn't changed as much as many of you have heard. And again, we'll talk about that in another minute or two. The guidelines continue to recommend less sodium uh, and um, less sugar. Uh, and what's new in the 2015 guidelines is a quantitative recommendation for getting less than 10% of calories from added sugars. Now for some of the details behind those, uh, um, uh, gen that, uh, those general guidelines. Um, unlike the Scientific Advisory Committee's report that came out in February, the guidelines don't explicitly recommend that we all eat less meat. But the guidelines do note that eating less meat and less processed meat is linked to a lower risk of cardiovascular disease, mostly heart attack and stroke, obesity, diabetes, and some types of cancer. Uh, and the guidelines in particular do recommend that teenage boys and men eat less meat because those are the groups that consume too much. Uh, this is a graph from uh, chapter two of the guidelines. And you can see very clearly on the left there that um, teenage boys and men, are their average intakes are considerably higher than the recommended levels. On sugars, uh, the, uh, again, there's a new advice to uh, limit sugars to less than 10% of calories. Uh, and that 10% recommendation has led the FDA to propose a daily value for added sugar. So that uh, if the FDA's proposals are finalized, food labels will tell consumers how much added sugar is in a particular food and also how much of a day's worth of added sugar that food contains. Uh, and again, the evidence, um, the, the guidelines make clear that there's evidence that eating less sugar is linked to a lower risk of cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and some types of cancer. And this is a graph, again, from chapter 2 showing how much our average intakes exceed the recommended levels. Also, there's very nice, a couple of very nice pie graphs in the guidelines. This is one showing where our added sugars come from. Um, it's somewhat shocking that almost half of all added sugars come in the form of sugar sweetened beverages. On cholesterol, uh, the 2015 guidelines don't have a key recommendation limiting cholesterol in foods. Uh, but that doesn't mean that cholesterol doesn't matter. The guidelines recommend as little cholesterol as possible. And they point out that the average American already consumes less than the 300 milligrams per day that the earlier guidelines recommend. On sodium, the guidelines recommend less than 2,300 milligrams a day, for not only for adults, but for teenagers. Uh, and they recommend only 1,500 milligrams a day for people who have either high blood pressure or pre-hypertension. And together, those two groups comprise two out of every three adults. So it's quite a sizable chunk of the population. And uh, the guidelines have a very nice graph showing how many Americans, what percent of Americans exceed the uh, recommended levels. On saturated fat, again, the guidelines recommend less than 10% of calories from saturated fat, replacing them with unsaturated fats uh, rather than with particular uh, refined carbs like sugars and uh, white flour. Um, and the evidence is quite strong that uh, reducing saturated fat can lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. And there's a nice graph, again, showing that uh, saturated fat intakes do exceed the recommended levels. And there's also a graph showing where we typically get most of our saturated fat. 
As Dr. Salvo noted, most Americans aren't following the guidelines. And I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about why. Because some critics have charged that the guidelines are somehow to blame for our unhealthy diets and for the obesity epidemic in particular. While we'd like to think that advice from health professionals is the key driver for what people eat, I think that lets the food industry off the hook too easily. The fact is that the average American is bombarded with billions of dollars of advertising for foods and beverages every year. Some of those foods may be healthy, but many are not. These ads aren't really selling health. They're selling happiness. They're selling uh, the chance to be like celebrities like Beyonce and Michael Jordan. Um, and they're very powerful. And it's not just ads of the foods that were served. Not just in restaurants, but these days everywhere we turn. In gas stations, convenience stores, drug stores, movie theaters, sports arenas, shopping malls, you name it. There's high calorie, unhealthy food everywhere 24-7. This is a photo I, I took outside of a, a Costco where I sometimes shop. You can't really see too clearly, but the, one of the most popular items is that quarter pound hot dog. Uh, it comes with a 21 ounce soft drink and unlimited refills all for $1.50. Uh, this was a survey the New York Times took asking people what they typically get at Chipotle. And the median uh, order had about 1,000 calories and almost a day's worth of sodium. Uh, this is uh, just California Pizza Kitchen. I could have picked any restaurant. Uh, this is, uh, these are some numbers for pizzas that appear to be quite healthy. Um, at California Pizza Kitchen, people order their own pizza just like they order their own dish of pasta or uh, salad. Um, and virtually every pizza on the menu, including these uh, healthy ones, have at least 1,000 calories. And it's not just California Pizza Kitchen. We have looked at Applebee's, Chili's, Maggiano's, Outback Steakhouse, TGI Friday's, Uno Pizzeria, virtually all the chain restaurants, their meals start at about 1,000 calories per entree. Uh, at some places like Cheesecake Factory, it's easy to get entrees with 2,000 or so calories. And it's not just chain restaurants. This is a study done by Susan Roberts at Tufts University. They analyzed uh, uh, entrees and side dishes from all of, uh, a number of different kinds of restaurants in the Boston area, American, Mexican, Chinese, Italian, Japanese, Thai, Indian, Greek, Vietnamese. The average entree and sides had 1,300 calories. <clears throat> and that's no beverage, no dessert, and no appetizer. And it's not just the meals. Uh, here's just a random sampling of some snacks that people might get in between meals. At Smoothie King, a 40 ounce, that's a large smoothie, has uh, a, uh, 760 calories if you get this immune builder, uh, which sounds pretty healthy. Smoothie King has some smoothies with 1,400 calories in a large. Uh, at Starbucks, of course, a venti peppermint mocha frappuccino has 560 calories. And a scone in Europe, there are 1,000 calories. At Cinnabon, uh, regular Cinnabon has 880 calories. The pecan roll has 1,200. Five Guys says that its french fries have 950 calories. Uh, movie theater popcorn, one of our favorite topics. Uh, these data are from 2009 because the industry doesn't actually publish any data. But this is a, a, a medium on the left and a large on the right uh, uh, movie theater popcorn at Regal. This is with no butter. Uh, the only they both have 1,200 calories. The difference is with the large, you get free refills. And just to show a contrast. Uh, this is um, a page from our Nutrition Action Health Letter showing what a healthy diet should look like. It's got about 2,000 calories. It's based on a version of the DASH diet, so it's not too different than the kind of diet recommended in the guidelines. Um, and it looks quite different uh, than the kinds of foods most people see everywhere they turn in what some would call a toxic food environment. So uh, while we applaud the new guidelines for good advice based on good science, uh, it's very important to remember that it's going to take more than advice to change the nation's eating habits. Thank you very much, Bonnie, for, for um, uh, your perception of what's, what's causing the problems in the American diet and, and uh, what's in the dietary guidelines. Um, the, um, I think we have a number of questions that have been submitted. Let me. Um, 
start with one for Dr. DeSalvo. Um, uh, when will the U.S. dietary guidelines be expanded to cover children ages zero to two years old? Uh, thank you for the question, and and, and thank you also for this, this this startling presentation on the cal the caloric content of food. It's always such an important reminder um, for all of us that every choice we make uh, is, is impactful and important. And the more data that we have out there, not only about the right choices, but about what people are consuming, the better off we're going to be. So better menu labeling, better um, better better um, labeling on on food products is just another way to empower and help folks. Um, in 2020, we will be including um, um, age groups 0 to 2 in the, in the dietary guidelines for Americans. Thank you. Um, this, this next question is probably for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which isn't here, but the question is, um, Dr. DeSalvo, when you talked about how the dietary guidelines is um, incorporated into federal food programs like school breakfasts and lunches. The question is, what about SNAP, uh, the food stamp program? Uh, to, uh, can it, will it be changed to support healthy beverages by allowing only non-sugar sweetened beverages to be purchased with SNAP benefits? So the, the caller, or the, the questioner is, is correct that the there are federal programs that use the dietary guidelines as, as guideposts and as guides, whether we're talking about Meals on Wheels programs or some of the school programs or for some of the other um, efforts that are designed to provide supplemental nutritional assistance. Um, and, and with respect to making any changes based on these guidelines, so that, that is, that's not something I can speak to for the, the school snack piece for the USDA. What I would share from my own personal experience of having been um, in Louisiana, which is um, where I'm from, and I was the health commissioner in New Orleans, what our community did, um, and, and, and it mirrored what the state did, was work with public health leaders and uh, the community, as well as with the, the soft drink businesses, to make legislation that would that would prevent there being prevent access to sugar sweetened beverages in in school age kids and vending machines and set expectations about, about non-sugar sweetened beverages and, and the availability for that at the elementary level and then up into high school. And, and that was, uh, for, you know, in, in some schools further extended to include um, functions and what they sold in their snack bars as for fundraisers. They, the, the school children, quite frankly, in particular in, in New Orleans were, were um, very, uh, uh, very thoughtful about, about their food intake. So my, my, my point there is we can we set out the, the best available science, and we make guidelines, and we implement and execute on that in our programs. Communities can really uh, make a difference on the front lines by picking up these guidelines and applying them to legislative changes, to, to purchasing changes, and really just to even the, the, the smallest places where you're having a function in a school and you want to be thoughtful to what you're serving. Uh, good. Well, you know, I think we can all expect there are to be big battles over the uh, appropriateness of allowing SNAP benefits to, to, um, be, to go for sugar-sweetened beverages. And there's a follow-up question regarding um, translation of the guidelines into federal policies. Uh, when can we expect the uh, Food and Drug Administration to finalize the nutrition facts label? So the, yeah, the Affordable Care Act calls on the FDA to, to make a nutrition facts label one that is accessible and understandable. I suspect most people on this call are aware that we have put out a proposed rule and took in public comment and feedback, and we're in the process of evaluating that and, and thinking about what's the, the best way to, to put that forward. So no particular news on timing of it, except that it's still in the works. Thank you. Um, the, can you explain the caffeine recommendation in a little more detail? Certainly. I think the place to start is, is that caffeine is not a nutrient, but can just is a dietary component. So it's not a necessary thing that, that has to be a part of a healthy eating pattern. On the other hand, because it's so commonly ingested and, and because it is um, um, something, there is some body of, of evidence. We, we made a recommendation to limit 
uh, caffeine intake, which typically comes in coffee, to three to five eight ounce cups a day. And because it's not a nutrient and, and therefore not necessary, if people are not consuming caffeine, uh, there's no need to recommend that they begin. Um, and um, nuance to that also is, is that um, it, we, we do, uh, do want to give guidance to people to avoid mixing it with alcohol. Yeah, and just to, that, that was for an eight ounce cup of coffee, which at a place like Starbucks basically does not exist. <laughs> yeah. It's really tough. Right. Well, and, and, and you know, and the, yeah, because the additional piece of this is, is that people put, put fatty dairy products and, and added sugars into the coffee, which adds to the caloric content and it's really not, you're not getting the, nu the nutrient density. So, so the, the coffee and caffeine is one piece of it, but what, we can, what we're adding into it on top of that sometimes can, can um, add calories without adding in the nutritional value. I think Bonnie gave a good example at a Starbucks. Mm -hmm. um, and is there that three to five, eight ounce cups of coffee? Is there anything mentioned about pregnant women or women who might become pregnant? Yeah, it, it, generally the recommendation there is they should talk with their doctor about that, um, about how much they're taking in and whether they should continue. But there is a recommendation that I want. You know, it was, right. Bonnie mentioned this a little bit earlier. Bonnie mentioned this a little earlier, but I just wanted to weigh in again and say that um, uh, the, if people go to dietaryguidelines.gov and, and play around on the website, it's, it's a really pretty accessible document, even though there's a fair amount of scientific content and it's um, designed, obviously, for health professionals and nutritionists. It's, it's pretty approachable to, to even a lay audience, um, uh, you know, depending on what you're searching for. There's a, the three chapters, and then there's a set of appendices, which get into more of the scientific content. There's a lot of nice graphs and figures. And the other go-to resource is the, the choosemyplate.gov, which, of course, has Miplatos, which is all, so there's Spanish and English options. And they, the USDA upgraded their sites yesterday and added some new content. And there's some, on, the, on a mobile device, as an example, when you go onto the website, there's a series of easily accessible quizzes and um, and sort of other ways that you can do a calorie a calorie expectation counter. So there's some nice games and tools, is what I might say, to make it more interactive. And and so I'd encourage people to go take a look there. Will the guidelines come out as a as a printed report also? Uh, yeah, yes, we do intend to put it out as a printed report. Um, and to and to your earlier comment, it won't be a pocket size small document so that'll have to stay in your in your iPhone or your smartphone um, but there will be there will be a document that will come out um, in the in the next in the next month or two. Yeah, I'm not sure what the printing timeline looks like. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Um, another question for Dr. Salvo. What policy strategies would you suggest that would reduce meat intake in adolescent boys and men? Well, that's a great question because so much of, of what we can see in terms of, of the opportunities to make changes on a population level where we want to reduce intake in areas like sodium or, um, or sugar-sweetened beverages, added sugars, added fats, or avoidance of trans fats are big policy level levers that, that we can take at the federal and state and local level. The, the, the protein intake, really, this is going to have a lot to do with family and individual knowledge and choices. Uh, this is going to be, um, I think, a, a recognition that, that it's a zero-sum game with respect to, gal to calories, essentially. And so as the uh, boys and men are, are filling up their plates, they need to, they need to, to take some control over that and, and think about reducing their protein intake and adding uh, vegetables and 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 fruits and whole grains and, and lean dairy. Now, all that said, for adolescents, the school environment is a place where they're going to get a lot of their calories. Less and less as they age, they tend to um, not always go through the line like the, the younger kids do. But the more we can continue that, that important effort that's already making a difference in school, school food programs, that is showing that kids are actually eat, choosing to eat more fruits and vegetables in, in school programs, and make sure we're extending that into high schools and, and continuing to provide the education and the role modeling. Um, that, uh, that's, that's one way that we can help them from a policy standpoint, but, but I think also just help them make better choices as individuals. 
Uh, good. Um, Bonnie, uh, here's a question for you. Is it correct to say that the 2015 dietary guidelines softened the sodium advice? I would say that the uh, 2015 guidelines, in a sense, strengthened the advice because the 2010 recommendation was to get less than 2,300 milligrams a day for the general public, but um, certain segments of the publication of the population at high risk, uh, African Americans, people with hypertension, people over the age of 51, were advised to get 1,500 milligrams a day or less. Um, that's about half the public, uh, the population. The new guidelines uh, say that um, anybody with prehypertension or hypertension should be getting less than 1,500 milligrams a day, and that's two thirds of the population. So, at best, it's the current advice is as strong as it was in uh, 2010, and you could even argue that it's stronger. Uh, Good. Uh, even though uh, the, there was a softening in that the 1,500 milligrams has been pulled out of the headline, the key recommendation. So, um, so the media is blind to uh, to that. Um, the uh, next question is uh, for Bonnie. The FDA made a very important move to ban trans fat. Um, industry undoubtedly plays an important role in what we find in our stomach. So how much influence does the food industry have on the recommendations and how can these guidelines be used to counter the very effective means those industries use to promote their foods? I think you should answer that question, Mike. That's a, uh, a trans fat. I think that's close to your expertise. Well, I'm not sure if it's the, the uh, 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 let me just focus on the, the question that was submitted. Uh, it starts out with trans fat, and the the uh, trans the 20, uh, 2005 guidelines certainly helped uh, move the country in the right direction and accelerated industry nascent move to get rid of trans fat. But I think the, the question is more general: um, What is the influence of industry on the guidelines and in what we find in our stomachs. How much, and I think it's, it's clear that the industry has a huge influence. Uh, it lobbies the administration, as everybody is free to do, and lobbies Congress. And they have a lot of influence on Congress. Um, they, uh, um, the Agriculture Committee held a hearing three months ago at which Secretary Vilsack uh, and I think Secretary Burwell agreed that the dietary guidelines would not include sustainability, which was kind of an ancillary reason mentioned in the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee's report, an ancillary reason to reduce consumption of, of meat and certain other animal products because of all the, the problems in um, the resource intensive, intensive uh, animal agriculture. Um, yeah, I, this is Karen. I, I, I would I want to just contribute to the conversation there and, and start with the fact that the dietary guidelines process, as I've described, and, and the work of the advisory committee is steeped in scientific approach and using the best available science. So science does evolve over time, and it's our responsibility to continuously look at that in partnership with, with the advisory committee and the public. Um, we, I, I think that one of the reasons that there's consistency in, in the guidelines is because the, the scientific evidence would continue to be consistent. And so um, we, we certainly want to use the, and do use the best available science that we have when we're making our decisions and our policy recommendations because our first and only responsibility is to the American people. They are our customer and that's who we're, we are here to protect. Um, and an example uh, of the, the sustainability that you raise, I just want to provide some clarity because you're right, that's been talked about. And sustainability um, was, was raised by the advisory committee. Um, it is out of scope for the work of the dietary guidelines themselves, so, but the administration does have other work in sustainability just within the, the expectations and, and the statutory scope of the dietary guidelines. It, it, it was not part of, of anything that we were going to include. The, the meat 
guidelines. As on, on the other hand, uh, are in scope and are what we have in 2015 is consistent with what we recommended in, in 2010 and it's consistent with what the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee recommended. Industry's influence, is, when you look at industry's influence, it's very clear that uh, the sugar and uh, high fructose corn syrup industries uh, didn't, didn't win, that the guideline is crystal clear about limiting consumption of refined sugars. Uh, Though, in my opinion, the meat industry um, um, certainly had a significant influence. But the uh, next question for Dr. DeSalvo is, um, why in the consumer material, my plate, my wins, but I think it, it often, it also refers to the dietary guidelines. Why does it say limit saturated fat, sugar, and sodium, rather than naming the foods to limit? Consume, uh, in contrast, it says eat more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Uh, consumers may not understand nutrients, which we healthcare providers do. Uh, Michael, just to, just to go back over this, the, the, the confusion that people are having about the meat recommendations, that they, are, they are the same. The, the, there was no change in our recommendations about, about protein intake and meat intake between 2010 and 2015 and between what the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee recommended. So the, the, there's that. Um, with respect to the MyPlate, um, I, I, this is a USDA product, so I don't want to specifically comment on how they formulate it, but I, 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 it is an important reminder that, that saturated fat, just as an example, is in so many types of foods and food groups, you know, proteins and dairy. And so um, it, it's uh, important to help people, just like sugars are in so many foods or salts are in, in so many foods and beverages, that um, the, probably the, re is the recommendation is meant to be as broad as possible to give people as broad of guidance as they begin to, to develop their healthy eating pattern. Good. Another question, uh, shifting the focus a lot, any ideas of how professionals health professionals can better emphasize the physical activity guidelines to consumers. Well, this is, um, yeah, I'm, glad that, I'm glad they raise it because it's a really uh, important part of the balancing equation that what we take in from foods and beverages, our healthy eating pattern that works for us, for our communities, um, it has to be balanced with activity because we also know that, that the Staying healthy or preventing chronic disease like hypertension and, and cardiovascular disease, amongst uh, other chronic diseases, is, is also impacted by physical activities that you know, are a risk factor for some of those chronic diseases itself. So we have physical activity guidelines that um, are available. And in fact, to your, your, it's a good prompt uh, for me to let folks know that we have a call out right now to, to reconstitute the next physical activity guidelines committee because we're beginning that scientific cycle of, of formulating that group so they can look at the best available science and, and make recommendations that um, come out in the next couple of years for, the, for people uh, around the physical activity guidelines. Yeah, getting people to exercise more is, a, is such a huge challenge. Um, there's it, it, it is, and, and, and you'd had a, a kind of a policy question earlier, and I'm sorry to interrupt, I, this is uh, the health commissioner and me, you know, coming out. That, that exercise is one component of it. Just being active makes such a big difference. I mean, this is, this is the built environment. This is complete streets policies in the, at the community level. This is, this is uh, uh, the architectural opportunities we have for open stairwells and that we all need to be taken into account as part of the health and all policies approach to achieve uh, health for everyone. And I think that's really something that starts in schools with um, high quality physical activity also. Um, question, does the 10% sugar recommendation include naturally occurring sugar like in whole fruits or dairy or just added sugar? Uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. It's, it's about added sugars rather than those that are naturally occurring in fruits and, and other foods. Good. Um, another question. Um, is there anything about in the guidelines 
about artificial or non-caloric sweeteners like stevia or sucralose, diet soda, any concerns about diet soda expressed in the guidelines. Yeah, that, that, um, the, in the, the guidelines we point out that the FDA has generally recognized those as safe and um, they're generally recognized to be, to be considered allowable in a healthy dietary pattern. I, I'd say that many, many of us, whether clinically or otherwise, would recommend to folks to make sure that they're not just substituting out for those kinds of uh, beverages, but making sure they're having plenty of water in their diet as well. Uh, just a note, uh, CSPI has called on the FDA to ban aspartame because there are three animal studies, uh, very well done animal studies, showing an increased risk of cancer. But we'll talk about that another time. Uh, do the caffeine recommendations apply to children also? So, so the guidelines themselves are for are for age groups two and above in general, and uh, just as we in the, in the caffeine recommendation itself says that for people who already consume caffeine, to have three to five down cups a day of, of coffee as an example would be part of a healthy eating pattern. Uh, if, but if people do not already consume caffeine because it's not a nutrient, it's not a necessary part of a healthy diet. So putting those things together, since most kids are not consuming a caffeine or certainly we wouldn't want to in increase their consumption of caffeine, uh, that, that we wouldn't say it was a necessary part of a healthy eating pattern. This is a, another important place where working with your doctor and the clinical team um, and making certain that there is a conversation about the intake of nutrients and then and then dietary components like caffeine is, is just an important conversation that can be had in the clinical environment as well. I don't think toddlers uh, should be, if they are drinking three to five cups of coffee today, they ought to stop. I don't think there'd be any uh, controversy about that. Well, yeah, I don't know a lot of toddlers I give caffeine to, but, <laughs> but that's me. Uh, we have tons more questions, obviously. obviously the, the dietary guidelines covers just a waterfront of issues, uh, and it's very interesting and complicated. Uh, there are lots of sections, lots of sidebars and graphs that I really urge people to get, be get beyond the headlines and look in detail at the dietary guidelines. Um, certainly don't believe just what a newspaper article has to say. So it looks like we've run out of time. Let me thank you so much, Dr. DeSalvo, for participating in this. And Bonnie Liebman also, thanking, yeah, thank you for your participation. And for the hundreds of people on the call, thank you all. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Look forward to working with you more. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.